Alrighty guys, welcome to the Gyoto Chef Knife Challenge. Ten knife makers have gotten together here on YouTube to do a head-to-head -head chef knife challenge. These videos will all be posted today at the same time, so make sure you go and watch each one of them before voting on which knife you like the best. The masterminds of this project include Tyrell from Tyrell Knifeworks and Aaron from Aaron Lee Knives. The other channels included are Blackbeard Projects, The Art of Craftsmanship, Fairway Forge, The Green Beetle, Brian from House Work, Sperber Knives, and The River's Experience. Before throwing your vote into the mix, make sure you go to each of these guys' channels and watch their Gyoto Chef Knife Challenge video. Also, if you know what's good for you, make sure you subscribe to each of their channels as well. Alrighty, so I know that after going through the list of my competition here, that I'm going to have some very fancy, very well-made chef knives to compete against. And this is the first chef knife that I have ever made. So I'm going to take a slightly different route and go for the cleanest yet simplest design that I can put forward. I have found in the past with some of my other knives that even though the design and construction of a knife is fairly simple, if it is done correctly and cleanly with a very good fit and finish, you can have a surprisingly nice product at the end of your build. As y'all saw towards the beginning of the video, I will be using 100 thousandths of an inch thick AEB-L stainless steel for my chef knife. Recently, I built a heat treating oven. That was actually my last video, but I made this knife before I had that oven. So you will not be seeing me use that oven for this build, and that is why. While it is a shame I don't get to play with my new toy, I think it's very good for everyone to see that you do not need a lot of equipment for a quality heat treat, and all you have to do is send off your blade for heat treatment by a professional. In this case, I sent these blades to Jared Todd, and he was able to get this blade up to a 61 Rockwell hardness and also straighten it out for me so that I have a nice straight blank to work with that has been heat treated. I know there are many knife makers out there who send off their knives exclusively to professional heat treaters, and I can see it being attractive for a few different reasons. First of all, if you're new to the game and you don't have a bunch of high-end heat treating equipment, being able to send off your knife and know that it was heat treated correctly can be a major advantage, especially if you're using steels that would be hard to heat treat with a forge. Which is the second reason you may want to send off your knives, because you cannot heat treat some of these steels in a home forge effectively. By sending off your knife to the professional, you know for sure that your high-end steel or stainless steel was heat treated correctly. Lastly, if you're doing a bunch of batch work, I can see it being advantageous to send off 10 or 20 blanks to a heat treater so that you don't have to worry about heat treating these knives yourself. So those are the reasons that I think a professional heat treater would be useful for the knife maker, whether he is a beginner or a professional. So what you just saw me do was get the spine of the knife up to a 220 grit finish. And then I put this guy on my DIY surface grinder so I can verify that I am flat on both sides and I brought up both sides to a 360 grit gator belt finish. All right, the next step here will be to grind in my bevels. To do so, I need some targets along the edge. I will be setting two parallel lines along the edge of my blade that are 10 thousandths of an inch apart. To do that, I'm using a height gauge and a granite surface plate. I have landed on this method as being my standard method to mark my center line target. However, there are a multitude of other options. The cheapest option is to use a drill bit that's diameter is the same dimension as the thickness of your stock. You can also use a dedicated centerline scribe that rides along the flats of your blade, or you can use a height scribe. The height scribe method works just like the height gauge method, just a little bit cheaper to put together. Once you have your targets scribed onto the edge of the blade, the next step is to grind to those targets at an aggressive angle. I like to use the rest to grind to these targets just so I can make sure that I hit them spot on. Now, I used to do this freehand, which is also fine, but I do find that the rest gives me way more control to make sure that my edge will be in the center of the blade. Getting this edge in the center is really a foundational step for the rest of your bevel grinding, so it is really worth your time to make sure that this is right. So this is what it looks like. I have about a 45 degree angle there getting to the center. I also made sure to put a scribe line along the back of the blade, along the spine, so that I have a target on the back of the blade while I'm grinding my bevels. 
I like having that line there just to make sure that my angles are all symmetrical on both sides. For the bevel grinding process on this knife, I'm going to be using a new grinding method, or at least a new grinding method to me. I know there are a lot of knife makers out there who use this push stick method with great success, so I wanted to give it a go. It took a little while to get used to at first, but I was able to make it through the entire blade using this method. You get a lot of control on the pressure with this push stick, and you need to be very careful not to overheat your blade. I am using a piece of Teflon for my push stick that I purchased from McMaster Car. While it took a little while to get used to, for a wide blade like this one, I found it to be a very handy method. The first step is to lightly land the blade onto the belt and then only apply pressure with the push stick while pulling your knife through with your off hand. You just repeat this process and you can use the push stick to push the grind up the bevel towards the spine of the knife. To remove the bulk of the material from my bevels, I used a fresh ceramic 60 grit belt. I worked up to around a quarter inch away from the spine on both sides and tried to keep my plunge lines fairly symmetrical during this process. I found the closer you keep your plunge lines with the low grit belts, the easier it is to clean them up later with these high grit belts. I then moved to a 120 grit J-Flex belt and at this point in the process, I wanted to clean up my plunge lines as well. I will run that belt off of the side of the platen so that the belt will curve around the edge of the platen and really get into my plunge lines. I still used the push stick method here, and I found that with the push stick, I have a good deal of control for moving that bevel up towards the spine. So here is what the 120 grit belt finish looks like. The next step is to run a 220 grit belt on our machine. Note that as you go up in grit size, it will also increase the heat generated by the belt. The higher grit belts like the 220s, the 320s, and the 400s will produce significantly more heat than a 36 or a 60. Just be cognizant of this fact and make sure to keep your blade cool by dipping it in water frequently. After we finish up with the 320, we'll move on to a 400 grit cork belt that has been loaded with green buffing compound. I have found that these cork belts do a pretty darn good job at getting out the previous scratches from the 320 and also setting you up nicely for hand sanding. You can see coming up here that I played around with freehanding the knife on the cork belt versus using the work rest and I actually found that using the work rest was a little bit easier which is how I ground the entire blade to this point so I don't know why I tried to change in the first place. I found that using my thumb instead of the push stick was a better alternative here so I can really get a good feel for the blade and how hot it's getting. So after a few hours of grinding, this is how the knife turned out with a nice cork belt finish on both sides. Note here that the spine of the knife has a very sharp corner and for use as a chef knife, this is unacceptable. So the next step will be to knock off this corner with the belt. Now, I probably should have done all this by hand. Using the belt sander for this operation can get a little sketchy and actually, you know, I can go too far on one side versus the other but I was extremely careful when I was doing this and I did not wreck the blade. Once I got the bulk of that corner knocked down with the 320 grit belt on the belt sander, I used some 320 grit paper with some hard backing to clean up my work on the belt grinder on the spine of this knife. We're then gonna move on to hand sanding our bevels. To do so, we'll use some 320 grit Rhino Wet sandpaper with hard backing. Note that in the beginning of the hand sanding process, you should probably be using hard backing opposed to soft backing like rubber. This will allow you to keep your bevels nice and flat during the beginning of the hand sanding process, and then you can use the softer backings towards the end in order to get nice smooth lines along the length of the blade. I find myself switching to a softer backing when I only have about 10 to 20% of the hand sanding left to do. Also note that we are sanding at a diagonal with the 320 grit so that we can see all of our 320 grit scratches once we move up to a 620 grit paper. Here I'm using this 600 grit paper and you can actually see that I have a very small flaw here. The key is to move around your lights so that you can see these small flaws and make sure that you sand them out. The last thing you want is to finish your entire knife and then find one of these small flaws in your finish. So now that we're done with our hand sanding, we'll move on to the handle scales. I'm gonna be using some rosewood handle scales along with some G10 liners. In general, I find that liners are pretty easy to add to your knife, and for such an easy thing, they add a ton of class to your build. So make sure to start using some liners in your builds 
if you aren't already. In my case, I'll be using some black and some red liners so I have a lot of colors and contrast going on when looking at the knife from the spine. So we get all the pieces nice and flat on the surface plate with a little bit of sandpaper and then we'll start stacking our pieces. I'm using the black piece down first, followed by the red and then the rosewood. We put epoxy in between each of these layers and then clamp them with just some cheap plastic clamps that I picked up from Harbor Freight. I found that the clamping force of these little Harbor Freight clamps is just about perfect for this operation. We'll then let the epoxy dry for 24 hours before messing with these scales anymore. In the meantime, we're going to etch our maker's mark into the blade. To do this, I'll use my DIY etcher set on DC power. I'll hit it about 12 times with the DC and three or four times with AC to darken it up. Once we have our mark nice and deeply etched into the blade, I'll take some 1000 grit sandpaper and make some very fine strokes along the length of the blade. This will clean up any residue left on the flats of the blade and really make our maker's mark pop. Hand sanded finishes really aren't my specialty, but every time I do them, I love the way they turn out. I think the contrast of the maker's mark to the hand sanded finish along the length of the blade always turns out looking extremely classy. Now that we've given the epoxy around 24 hours to cure, we will remove our clamps and start working on our handle scales. They are obviously too thick for this knife and we will address that later on the build, but to start off we need to clean up all the sides. I get my work rest to a 90 degree angle to my platen, get my dust collection in the appropriate location, and start cleaning up the corners of these scales. I want to make sure that I don't have any gaps between the spacer material and the handle scales themselves, so I grind as far as necessary to make sure that all three layers are even with each other. In order to reduce the thickness of these handle scales, I'm going to be trying a new method. And I've seen many knife makers use this method on their surface grinding attachments. I'm going to be putting a piece of masking tape on each of the scales and then putting a piece of masking tape along the surface grinding attachment. I'll then put some drops of super glue onto the scales with the tape side up and then mash that against this big piece of tape on my magnetic chuck. The idea here is to be able to hold these handle scales onto your magnetic chuck, but still be able to remove them easily. The mistake that I made was to use way too much super glue. It was actually very difficult to get these scales off of my magnetic chuck. If you're going to be using this method, make sure to only use two or maybe three drops, opposed to the approximately six drops that I used. Once I had the handle scales attached to the surface grinding attachment, Getting their dimension down to what I was shooting for, which was a little bit more than a quarter of an inch, was fairly simple. I would advance the table towards the wheel gently, make a few passes, and then repeat the process until I had the handle scales to the thickness that I wanted. To get them off, I used a pair of pliers here, and it put way too much torque on the system, so in the future, I think I'm going to use way less super glue. To attach the handle scales onto the knife, we're going to be making some loveless fasteners, with my Atlas lathe from 1937. I have a whole video on the process of making loveless fasteners, but I'll breeze through it right here. The first step is to get our quarter inch stock into our collet block and then drill a hole through the center. We'll then tap this hole to a 632 thread. In this case, we're using 303 stainless since this is a kitchen knife and we don't want anything that will corrode in the kitchen environment. Now, while making your own fasteners probably is not the most efficient use of your time in the knife shop, I must say that it is fun to make just about every component on the knife, and it gives me a chance to play around with my new lathe. After you have your hole drilled and tapped, we'll use a cutoff tool to cut off these little lugs, and we'll do this four times so that we have enough lugs for our Loveless fasteners. This is how the Loveless fasteners turned out. Note that I got the screws from McMaster Car. They are also stainless steel. To get our holes drilled and our handle scales, we will be clamping the knife onto the scales and using it as a drill guide. This is the technique that I use on pretty much all of my full tang knives. Note that I was using some old pieces of micarta as backing on my mill there when I was drilling those holes. That is so that we don't blow out the back of those holes when drilling through the scales. Once we have our holes drilled, we'll use some drill bits there to keep everything held together and then cut out the rough profile on the bandsaw. After we have the rough profile cut out, we'll get to the grinder and clean up our profile pretty close to our scribed lines. 
It is at this point that we're going to address the front of our handle scales. Now, when I was drilling the holes in the tang of this knife, I feel like I put some holes a little too close to the front of the handle scales. And this is a limitation for me on the geometry of the front of these scales. So I had to be very cognizant to cover up the holes in the tang with these handle scales. Happily, it all worked out at the end. However, if I had a chance to do it again, I would like to have a little bit more radius on the front of these scales. This is my counter bore. We're going to be counter boring our holes so that we can install our loveless fasteners. I set the depth on my mini mill with a washer that is around a sixteenth of an inch thick. I found that a sixteenth of an inch is just about the right depth for a Corby fastener head or for a loveless fastener. It gives you plenty of meat for those Corby fasteners or loveless fasteners to pull your handle together nice and securely, but also sinks the head of the loveless or Corby fastener sufficiently into the scale. Now that we have all of our pieces fabricated, we're going to move on to the glue up. The first step to any good glue up is to make sure that all of your pieces are nice and clean. To do this, we're going to use some alcohol to wipe all of our pieces down. Next, we'll mix up our epoxy. In my case, we're going to be using West Systems G-Flex epoxy. I have done significant testing to this epoxy, and after reading everything on the forms and testing it myself, I can vouch for it being the gold standard of knife making epoxy. So with our epoxy, we will coat the inside of both handle scales as well as the counterboard holes. We'll then push two of the loveless nuts into one scale and then the other two nuts into the other scale that have the bolts in them. Now you can apply your epoxy to the knife tang and then use the bolts in one handle scale as a guide to put the tang onto the scale. I make sure to fill up all of the holes at this point in the process so that those holes can act as little epoxy pins once your handle is together. I normally start off with hand tools at first to make sure everything is not cross-threaded and then I use a cordless drill with a low torque setting to finish it off. Once we have these fasteners tightened up, make sure to use some alcohol, q-tips, and paper towels to clean up the front of the handle scales because this will be significantly more difficult to do after the epoxy has cured. Once we've allowed 24 hours for the epoxy to cure, we'll cut off the heads of our loveless fasteners and then move over to the 2 by 72 inch belt grinder to start shaping the handle. I start off with a very low grit belt to do the bulk of my shaping. I normally flatten both sides of the handle scales first, and then I'll start bringing the handle scales down to the metal of the tang. Once I start getting close to the metal of the tang, I'll switch to a higher grit belt so as not to put big scratches in the metal tang of my blade. As some of you guys know, this Northridge grinder is a new grinder for me, and I'm really enjoying the ability to turn this thing horizontal and grind down the length of my spine. What you see me doing here is radiusing both sides of the handle scales on the flat platen, and then using a two inch contact wheel to knock off any large corners and kind of contour this entire handle to more of an oval shape. Once I have all the bulk of the material removed with the contact wheel, I'll use a slack belt to get everything nice and smoothed. This is about as far as I'll take it on the grinder. If aesthetics were not an issue, this would be a perfectly usable handle. However, aesthetics are an issue to us, so we will bring this handle all the way up to 1000 grit, starting at a 320 grit paper, moving up to a 600, and then finally to a 1000 grit paper. Make sure that when you are hand sanding the heads of Loveless or Corby fasteners, that you are using a hard backing like this one. If you don't do that, you will actually dome over your fasteners and will be able to feel that dome in your hand. The last step on this knife build will be to sharpen the blade. To do this, I will be trialing the housework sharpening system. I'm gonna have a whole video review on this system later on, but this is kind of a sneak peek. In a nutshell, you supply this thing with air from your air compressor, it pulls in water, and you can dial how much air and water is applied through the nozzle with the two dials on the side of the attachment. This water air mist allows you to run high grit belts on your belt grinder continuously without fear of overheating your edge and ruining the temper of your knife. So the two belts that I'm using here are actually part of his kit. The first belt I used was a 600 grit structured abrasive and the second belt that you see me using here is a 1200 grit belt. I will say that this method does take a little bit of practice since you are freehanding this bevel, 
However, I look forward to using this in the future on many more knives. Once I have the burr turned up with the 1200 grit belt, I'll use my leather strop on my wind sharpening system to knock that burr off. This could also be done on the belt sander with a leather belt. So to make sure I have a nice sharp edge, I cut some very lightweight paper and then I slice a tomato with my first chef knife. So I was pretty happy with how this guy turned out. It came out razor sharp. I liked the geometry of the knife. I think I could actually make more of this template without making any major changes to it. So like I said in the beginning of the video, I was shooting for a very clean and simple design and I think that I was able to achieve it with this knife. If you're interested in making this exact knife, I will be putting a PDF template on my Patreon for my patrons. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel. Lastly, make sure to watch the other nine Gyoto Chef's Knife builds associated with this challenge and then vote on the one that you like the most. With that, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.